Good afternoon, um, everybody, and welcome to the showcase um, by the COVID-19 Advisory Committee. It's actually their third webinar. Uh, the theme for today uh, is building forward stronger. And the idea for this is how do we build uh, beyond response and recovery towards resilient collaboration? Um, I apologize because my video will start working soon, but I think in the interest of time and based on the packed program, we have just decided to, to proceed. Um, I think, uh, as, we, as we know very well, COVID-19 um, basically has accelerated how we adopt technology, but also fundamentally transformed how we live, learn and work. There's been a lot of changes we've seen over time, but I think the fundamental issues that are our innovators basically have across the continent have basically uh, stood up and responded to the crisis. We have seen uh, unprecedented collaborations uh, between private sector, governments, and innovators. Uh, a case, an example, and this for me was, I thought was quite interesting, is that the government of Kenya, uh, through the minister, Honorable John Sheru, gazetted the ICT Committee on COVID-19 as a way within which government can begin to address the issues of whether it's technological adoption, issues around providing policy and financial enablers, and, and finally begin to see how you can scale up technology innovations uh, beyond COVID-19. And maybe at this time, I want to recognize the chair of the committee, um, uh, Masi Wanjau, um, and the deputy chair, Peter Njonjo. I'm sure there are also committee members on the call from Dr. Sijine, Oriokolo, Shiko Gitao, Hilda Mora, Mahmoud Noor, and Kevin Atibu. And over the last, from April 21, they've been listening to many of us uh, making presentations in terms of what it is that we need potentially, but also how can we plug into government uh, but also private sector in terms of responding COVID-19, but also it's other issues around uh, what we say in direct um, impacts. And I think for me then this showcase then was, was basically an understanding that can we um, think through uh, over the last six months, what has been the nature of collaborations, what has worked and what has not worked? Uh, how can we build forward better and, and what changes do we need to make? especially in, in a way that you need to enable innovators. So this session is, is in two parts. Uh, there's a, definitely a keynote session and ideally people asking why. I think it's important to understand why the political support or high level support, whether within private sector and government is important in supporting innovations. But the second bit I think is that showcase in terms of how did government and innovators and private sector collaborate. And we are fortunate in that section to have um, case studies from South Africa, uh, case studies from Kenya, case studies from Ghana and Nigeria, just to paint a picture in terms of a continental approach and, and what happened there. Um, and, and as we move forward, I also like to just a couple of housekeeping announcements. So for speakers, I think only when you speak, you can turn on a video when that is enabled, uh, potentially mute as much as you can. Let's try and stick to time. Um, and with that, without further ado, let me, uh, at this time, uh, have the pleasure of introducing um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Honorable John Sheru, to make his remarks. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip. Certainly, this is not the face of the cabinet secretary. This is the PS in the Ministry of ICT and Innovation. Uh, the cabinet secretary, uh, due to some uh, engagement, is not able to join us this afternoon. He sends his apology. But uh, based on the fact that he had really considered this uh, really a very important event, he's asked me to actually read his keynote address. So. We pass his apologies, and uh, you'll allow me now to read his uh, keynote speech. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, innovators, good afternoon. First and foremost, I wish to welcome everyone to this third session of our series of COVID-19 ICT Adversary Committee webinars for potential innovators. As a country, we are proud of the support and responsibility that has been exhibited by citizens 
and I salute the ICT fraternity and especially the young people for rising up to the occasion and ensuring that we as a country can overcome this pandemic. As we continue to restructure our lifestyles around the new normal, it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to continue being vigilant and for the technology sector to remain resolute on developing cutting edge strategies of coping beyond this pandemic. This resolve is underpinned in the webinar's theme, building forward stronger beyond response and recovery towards resilient collaboration. When I inaugurated the COVID-19 ICT advisory committee nearly six months ago, none of us had the end game in sight. I doubt whether we still do. However, today I can proudly state that from the overwhelming response and submissions received from over 700 potential innovations, the country is richly endowed with a bedrock of great minds, with ideas that shall change and transform the way we operate as a society. This clearly reiterates our Kenyan spirit to adapt and synergize during these great times of need. As we prepare to listen to the innovations that will be showcased today, I thank all the partners who are working along with us in this journey and are also helping us realize tangible outputs as we strive to scale up the innovation so far presented. I would like to particularly extend my sincere appreciation to the UNDP Kenya, represented here by Mr. Walid Badawi, World Economic Forum, represented by Ms. Elsie Kanza, and the Standard Chartered Kenya, represented by Ms. Susan Jeroge. Thank you for joining us today, and we seek your further support as we gear up to the next level. I would also like to pass on my appreciation to the COVID-19 ICT Advisory Committee, led by the chairperson, Mrs. Marcy Wenjao. As the committee terms nears its end, my ministry will see how best to progress this agenda. Various governance and policy mitigation re recommendations have already been presented to my office for the progression. It is then my desire to see the ministry and its various agencies oversee the uptake, implementation, and scaling up of the various innovations already presented. Currently, the Kenya's digital economy strategy is undergoing stakeholders review and a team that includes the National Treasury and my ministry is working towards ensuring that we reap big from the digital dividends. As a sector, we are presented with myriad opportunities and we cannot afford to fail. Together, let us synergize and support this agenda as the envisaged benefits are enormous globally. The most profitable blue chip companies globally are technology based. My wish and vision is for Kenya to have a stake in this space. I dream of the day the Nairobi stock market will be heralded by homegrown technology companies competing in the global arena. We can pursue this vision by scaling up the various innovations presented to the committee. We would like to nurture and incubate technology giants who shall provide jobs to our innovative youth and develop solutions that can be adopted and exported globally. Let me state that the government is also committed to better, efficient, and timely service delivery, and we shall continue to enhance our capacity to deliver upon this. Technology has proved to be the bedrock of our everyday work environment, with the most critical services being delivered remotely. Part of my ministry's mandate is to actively pursue the narrowing of the technology 
and the intelligence divides. As Minister of ICT, I therefore implore on you all to yield to our higher calling to serve humanity and also deploy technology to make the world a better place. This is no doubt in my mind showcase officially opened. Signed, Joe Mushel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, P.S. Jerome, uh, for, the, for the remarks. And I think it, it aptly puts it into, into context why we're here and potentially why we need to, uh, uh, to collaborate and to scale innovations. Um, without further ado, let me introduce Anis Masi Onjau, who has been the chair for the COVID-19 ICT Advisory Committee. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Um, indeed, we are very delighted to hold uh, this uh, webinar coming towards the end of our term. And I would like to propose to share the screen and give a quick rundown of the achievements we have made before making uh, a few remarks. Um, the mandate of the advisory committee was captured in a few key items. Uh, firstly, it was to coordinate the ICT-specific responses uh, to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And we will see shortly some of the things uh, that, uh, that we put in place, the initiatives, so that we could support the national and the county emergency response committees on the interventions that uh, could be put in place. One of the other TORs was also to establish an enabling environment that would stimulate economic uh, development through ICTs during this time and even after. And this entailed coordinating of innovators, academia, well-wishers, the private sector on the utilization of these resources. And finally, advice on key ICT initiatives, how the scaling up could happen, the products and job creation opportunities, as well as sustainability and the ubiquitous digital uh, learning. This uh, paved the way for a very exciting journey for this committee. We have done two rounds for calls for innovations and received over 700 submissions. Out of those, 85 have been identified for support and scale up. And uh, we have held two webinars uh, to give selected innovators an opportunity to showcase their solutions. And uh, we are delighted to report that out of this, some engagements are already happening. In terms of some of the recommendations that we see coming out of this uh, at uh, a policy standpoint level is uh, the need for Kenya to begin to evolve a framework on digital learning uh, so that this would then institutionalize uh, the use of ICTs as part of curriculum and also the allocation of resources to enable this. Secondly, is the rush for resources is on, and hence the need to commercialize the white spaces, which would provide additional um, opportunities and additional resources to deploy these innovations. Thirdly, uh, it has come alive in Kenya that the gig economy is growing and is deepening, and as a result, uh, the need for the, the communications authority to consider licensing individuals as courier service providers in order to formally support the gig economy. Uh, in the last couple of months, we also did uh, issue draft guidance notes on access to data by innovators, as this would enable to drive e-commerce and the digital economy, and uh, also provide a framework for protection for consumers. In terms of supporting and scaling up uh, of innovations, there have been a couple of asks from the innovators. Largely, um, innovators have been interested in uh, funding, whether it be grants, low cost capital or equity. And uh, for this, we have reached out to hubs and private sector support to advise and support on the funding for potential innovators. Other asks have constituted uh, requests for linkages 
with the government, the government and government agencies, as well as connections to potential innovators and accelerators. And this we have done and uh, we continue to do so that um, we are able to obtain uh, our desired objective at the end of all this, that no innovator uh, will be left unattended to at the end of this exercise, that they will have um, clarity in terms of a way forward. So finally, uh, going to the role uh, of these innovations during COVID-19, um, we have seen a lot of these innovations and largely the first one was to strengthen capacity, that this would be able to provide early warning, risk reduction, management of health risks and preparedness for future threats. And we will hear some of these. Secondly, is that uh, these innovations would provide useful insights to manage responses to the pandemic, as well as catalyze economic development and recovery. So that even as we look at the pandemic uh, season that we are in, we are also very keen and positive uh, on the rollout of the economy and growth out of the pandemic. And then lastly, to be able to leverage on these innovations to mitigate uh, new and existing social inequalities as have been brought out um, very starkly during this uh, pandemic. And in this way, ensure that environmental sustainability is retained and safeguarded, and that we are also able to achieve a more equal and equitable platform for participation courtesy of um, these innovations. Uh, going to the topic uh, of the day on fostering an enabling environment for resilient innovation and ecosystem, uh, we have identified a key, a few key elements as elements that uh, we will be making formal recommendations on from this task force, as these are key drivers in deepening the economic um, space for innovations and enabling uh, the evolution of drivers towards sustainability. And uh, with that, I would like to request to read through the remarks as I have them. Um, in recent years, Kenya has made significant progress in fostering socioeconomic development and strong programs coupled with the international environment investments, sorry, has led to improvements in regards to many of the development goals, such as education, health, gender equality, and leveraging on information and communication technology. However, social economic inclusion and poverty eradication still remain as a challenge. To address some of these challenges, Kenya has been making considerable strides towards establishing a more innovative innovation-driven economy. In the realm of the Kenya Vision 2030 strategic plan, innovations in investments made in infrastructure, as well as private sector initiatives, have been able to steer the country in the right direction. This course has been reinforced through the Big Four Agenda, a five-year action plan that puts strategic importance on ICT as a key enabler to realize immediate priorities and aims to utilize and reap benefits of the digital revolution to achieve social economic development, poverty eradication, and the long-term goals of the country. Despite these successes, there are still a variety of issues that need to be addressed in the establishment of an ICT-centric innovation ecosystem. The envisioned innovation ecosystem is currently a bit stagnated with missing linkages and inadequately guided innovation dynamics to enable entrepreneurs create high growth innovation and businesses arising out of this. These are some of the aspects that we identified, listening to the innovators, listening to some of the possible partners, we were able to identify missing linkages. And this brought us to the conclusion that there is need for further action to build up factors like private investment, last mile connectivity, ICT skills, and entrepreneurial support networks in particular. If these issues are addressed effectively, in our view, the country will be well positioned to become a regional leader in several key areas within the ICT sector. And some of the key areas that need to be addressed in working towards this kind of ecosystem 
are what is displayed on the screen. And um, I will go through the detailed aspect of some of them. Policy and regulation. Many regulatory and policy changes under the Kenya Vision 2030 led to the growth of the economy and the development of the ICT ecosystem. However, many policies appear to be incomplete and not entirely engaging on the digital innovation ecosystem. Some policies are outdated or are pending uh, legislative reform. And this exercise has highlighted the need to accelerate this process. Though the public sector is aware of its role on innovation, it is clear from the scope of the existing policies and programs that more is needed to stimulate funding, to incentivize investment, to nurture entrepreneurship and innovation, as well as to strengthen the intellectual property framework. Due to lack of a comprehensive mechanism for engagement of innovators, public sector is unable to nurture an enabling environment that will lead to private sector leadership in the ecosystem. This is fueled by the low level of trust between stakeholders and limited common understanding of the major issues and opportunities. This is one of the key recommendations that this task force will be making. And we are thankful that in the last... Uh, Um, is on infrastructure and programs. Hard infrastructure has seen tremendous growth in Kenya, particularly with respect to mobile phone penetration and broadband due to private and public investments. However, quality hard infrastructure is concentrated within urban areas with challenges in achieving the last mile connectivity. This has resulted to slower development of soft infrastructure with limitation to the same in urban areas. Thus, innovators in these nascent clusters are struggling to develop appropriate solutions. Additionally, significant improvements will be necessary in regard to soft infrastructure in order to foster inclusive innovation capacity throughout the country. This is a second uh, formal recommendation that we will be making, which continues to highlight the urgency to close connecti connectivity gaps, one of the mandates of the Communication Authority of Kenya, a commitment that we have scaled up during this period and intend to deepen in months coming forward. The third element is talents and champions. Um, because it became quite evident that while Kenya has quite some significant um, talent in this area, it does not entirely meet the demand of the ecosystem and requires improvement in terms of skill level and availability is necessary to develop a suitable skilled workforce to address current and future needs of industry and the ecosystem. There are some gaps in technical skills especially advanced skills, and there is need for broader soft skills development. The primary focus will be to, on upgrade of skills and will be targeted towards digital literacy in schools, retooling curriculums, expansion of broadband access in schools through education broadband connectivity projects, and the creation of centers of excellence in higher in higher education system. However, the persisting skill gap is preventing talent from moving to research, entrepreneurship, and innovation, something that would be a key factor in driving this forward. There are many programs with, pro, with a, there are many champions with programs addressing both soft skills and technical skills, but they operate in silos and do not have the necessary adequate support. And our hope in this making this recommendation is that it would spur guidance and renewed efforts to upgrade skills and talent and the innovation ecosystem would then uh, begin to experience uh, reinvigoration and in creation of success stories. Networks and markets. Uh, though there is sufficient domestic market size to get started, 
access for innovators was seen as limited due to challenges around transparency, fairness in procurement, and bias against local or Kenya-made innovations. Additionally, regional and international markets offer increased opportunities, but their access remains limited due to inefficient networks and linkages in, in the ecosystem. Both formal and informal networks that foster market access exist in the ecosystem, but they are not tailored to fully support the dynamics, the dynamics required in an ICT-centric ecosystem. And this is a factor that uh, we look towards uh, to alleviation of barriers that would then lead to creation of businesses and on a sustainable uh, platform. There is therefore need to foster and nurture innovation to develop networks and to facilitate global export. On to the fifth item, culture and economy and the community. Entrepreneurial uh, business culture in Kenya is seen as developing, but at, at an early age. This is partly due to the lack of jobs in the economy leading to young people uh, moving towards enter being entrepreneurs. Many operate in the formal sector and business ecosystems such as B2B, uh, business to business, business to government or business to consumer B2C are needed to help migrate them to the formal economy. This is an opportunity for digital entrepreneurs and should be nurtured vigorously by all stakeholders, especially in the private sector. Failure is not perceived well through support networks and academia have been making uh, and playing key roles in changing mindsets. Support networks are active in fostering appropriate business culture through events and projects in the ecosystem, but their efforts appear to be limited. Many countries and rural communities lack representation. And the recommendation that we would be making out of this is the need for strengthening community building with the aim to increase trust, increase networking and engagement in the ecosystem. Uh, going on to the last item on capital and resource, I had indicated earlier that uh, this has constituted the ask for quite a number of the entrepreneurs. Uh, out of noting that access to capital is very limited in Kenya, and more notably, uh, access to capital in the digital innovation ecosystem. The few existing public sector funds um, appear to be insufficient, and uh, it is not clear what the method of access might be. There are many efforts to encourage foreign direct investment, including various new instruments, such as special economic zones. However, these instruments are at an early phase of development and are not adequate to attract resources, especially the ICT ecosystem. We noted that research funding is still insufficient and directed at technical knowledge generation rather than commercialization of research. A sizable amount of funding for development of innovations and capacity building uh, is sourced from development partners. However, this does not qualify as a sustainable resource and would therefore not lead to a self-sufficient ecosystem internally. Without appropriate uh, risk capital, funding entrepreneurs and their ideas is limiting opportunities in the Kenya digital ecosystem. And some entrepreneurs are trying to create innovative solutions for solving financing gaps, but they need support to make an impact. Without funding, startup formation and SME growth will be stalled and consequently the, the ecosystem will not be able to thrive. And this is indeed one of the other formal recommendations that we will be making. Um, coming to a conclusion, um, we have noted that a lot of programs are creating bridges and enabling digital innovators to address opportunities in Kenya, but these are limited. They also appear to be fragment, um, fragmented. They are often not well capitalized and they lack resources. And uh, this is an issue of great constraint to many of them. Many communities uh, appear to be built around their champion's interest. 
but there is a need to bring them together more often in order to solidify and grow the ecosystem. Resources are also needed for community mapping and for events to help entrepreneurs bootstrap and access markets even beyond Kenya. Champions with good practices do not receive adequate re support um, as would be required. And this may be related to a misalignment of opportunities uh, and resources. And because of this, the need for the private and the public sector to come together and support the ecosystem. The government is aware of its role as a public sector and is taking significant steps to remedy the current ecosystem. Of course, it is appreciated that this requires a multi-sectoral framework, a reaching out between the private, the public, and the civil community to enable this happen. And we are hopeful that as we move um, to make this formal recommendation, and thank you to the participation that we notice on a, um, a, a call like this, on this um, uh, webinar, that uh, we are able to create visibility of this situation that would lead to engagement and growth as we move forward. So this brings me to the end uh, of my remarks. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Uh, quickly, um, I think I would like to request the Secretariat if they can avail the slides because we have a couple of partners uh, in the webinar who may be interested to have a deep dive on, on, the, on the amazing presentation that you've uh, given us. Quickly, let me go to uh, Mr. Walid Badawi, a good friend, the resident representative for the United Nations Development Program. He will focus basically on how to scale up innovations and potentially the use cases that came out of uh, the CONSA COVID-19 challenge. Stalin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, and indeed, a good friend. Uh, we, uh, uh, when Thunderbird, my former graduate school, comes calling, uh, I certainly will answer. And it was great to hear the two presentations by uh, P.S. Jerome and uh, Ms. Wanjiao. Very comprehensive indeed. And I think we, uh, from our side as UNDP, we, we echo uh, many of the policy recommendations and uh, fully supportive of those efforts. So maybe at the outset, I, I think we cannot underestimate uh, and appreciate the fora such as this one that uh, you're convening here, Philip, to allow us to discuss, share knowledge and ideas on how we can really uh, build forward stronger and more resiliently during these very uncertain times. Um, let me say that uh, indeed for us as UNDP and working within the UN family, uh, we are running a number of initiatives at uh, global, regional and country levels that uh, are ongoing to provide support to governments and people around the world to recover from COVID-19. Uh, we should never underestimate the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing and as UNDP we've done a, an assessment earlier in the year and for the first time since measurement began in 1990, uh, human development is indeed on, on um, track to decline for the very first time since then. But with every crisis comes an opportunity. And I think that's really where we are focused today and looking at uh, how can we take those opportunities to build better in the future. And for us as UNDP, we've been looking at this at multiple levels. And if we take Kenya as a case in point, uh, looking at both the enabling policy framework and uh, Ms. Wanjel talked about a number of the recommendations that the ICT Advisory Committee is making, which we fully, fully endorse. And how do these recommendations then um, find their way into the national socioeconomic recovery strategy planning uh, of the country uh, under the leadership of uh, National Treasury and the State Department of Planning as UNDP. We've been supporting that effort, which is putting in place a recovery strategy for the next two years, 24 months. But also at the sub-national level, working with the Council of Governors, we've been supporting uh, the, the county level socioeconomic uh, re-engineering and recovery strategy. But also we've uh, been designated by the Secretary General of the United Nations to lead the UN's own socioeconomic response planning. And I can assure you, at all of these levels, 
the issue of ICT and innovation is really at the center of our thinking um, and our interventions to see how that recovery can, can, can um, uh, be made uh, better and, and, and more resilient and greener. Uh, so let me come to um, an initiative that is uh, a key one for us, and that is our SDG Accelerator Lab, uh, which we were very proud uh, to inaugurate this in September 2019 on the sidelines of the General Assembly under the leadership of uh, CS Muchero, leading the government of Kenya, but also our UN resident coordinator. And we signed a communique together with the Rockefeller Foundation and the Center for Global Action at the University of California, Berkeley, to establish this SDG Accelerator Lab, which is a way to actually bring multiple stakeholders in a partnership framework that can unlock financing and innovations to tackle complex development challenges. Let me say that this Kenya uh, launch was also coinciding with a similar uh, uh, initiative that UNDP was uh, rolling out globally to set up uh, 60 accelerator labs around the world, including in Kenya, to do precisely that, to unearth solutions uh, for endemic development challenges uh, through uh, local innovations and trying to uh, um, bring these up to the fore to interrogate, you know, what are those things that uh, these young innovators, um, whether technology related or not, uh, and what do they need? And, and I think Ms. Manjao raised a number of issues, uh, the financing ecosystem, IP, uh, access to markets, and many others that, uh, that I think we, 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 we resonate with. But the Accelerator Lab is therefore a way to try and actually uh, address this. So the, the, the lab is, is actively engaged to support uh, innovators gain access to training, knowledge, networks, financial resources to be able to grow and scale up their ideas and, and solutions. And we're so happy to have co-created this with the Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs. Uh, we currently have uh, set in place a governance structure uh, with the priority areas uh, originating from the Big Four agenda. Um, and, and we are now actually seeing some uh, very concrete, tangible innovations that we've unearthed to be supported. So earlier this year, we were pleased to partner with the um, Konza Technopolis and the Ministry of ICT to support the Great COVID-19 Innovation Challenge, as, uh, as we know. And, and this really focused on three areas of innovations, uh, decent work, uh, food systems, and healthcare. And it created an opportunity, this call, for citizens to share their ideas on, on how some of the country's urgent needs can really be met. Um, uh, and what this validated for us is that Kenya is a hub of brilliance and, and creativity. We really saw uh, over 300 ideas and solutions, um, ranging from those that are reimagining the workplace and uh, engaging in technology to ensure safety and productivity of workers. Uh, we've seen innovations that are using big data and 4IR technologies to better understand human behaviors and attitudes and make policy recommendations also on organizational and, and market decisions um, from a, a, an informed perspective. And we've seen others that are responding to our current context by um, adopting new ways of connecting, making payments, learning and engaging customers through technology. So the winners from this challenge, uh, the three winners from this challenge will be joined by 12 other finalists in the second phase of this challenge, which is an acceleration program aimed at supporting them to scale and develop their innovations uh, to market. Let me just mention the three winners that uh, emerged from this uh, great COVID-19 challenge. The first place was uh, that are uh, working remotely, of course, because of COVID-19. Uh, the second uh, place was uh, Zinake, a cloud-based platform that connects temporary workers to job opportunities in their locality at the click of a button. And the third place was Garden Fresh, uh, a localized agri-food system 
uh, that provides year-round growing of food crops to promote urban access to sustainable food. Now this challenge and many others that uh, uh, we have also supported under the umbrella of Generation Unlimited have clearly brought home the need for uh, significant efforts to support these local innovations. Um, we know that Kenya's uh, innovators are in need of financial and technical support to enable them to develop their ideas to market and uh, create ready-made products and services. And so really through the Accelerator Lab, we hope to uh, create that space to be able to uh, provide that next level of support that uh, uh, Ms. Wanjiao also uh, alluded to. Um, we are collaborating with Hackster, which is the world's fastest growing developer community for learning, programming, and building hardware. And uh, we are working with them and with local innovators to develop, for example, uh, technologies around infrared uh, contact contactless thermometers, uh, pulse oximeters and touchless uh, hand faucets. And these devices uh, will be made available to local hubs so that more people can learn from them and utilize them so that we can grow and create uh, uh, and build on these, uh, these uh, local innovations. Also at the regional level and through you, Philip, uh, uh, guiding our work on this front, uh, UNDP is working towards uh, the development of a, of a project that is aimed at delivering an agile UNDP Africa digital strategy and programmatic offer that is supported by multi-stakeholder digital collaborative platforms. And so how we link, for, for example, our SDG Accelerate Lab to this regional offer by UNDP is part of that. And it's going to focus on achieving um, increased access to skills and reach of uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies. It will look at scaled up utilization of these innovations within an enabling policy environment. It's going to share knowledge and, uh, and, and create management and leadership structures in the 4IR uh, space. And, and we're very pleased that Kenya is actually one of the seven uh, early uh, action countries that will be benefiting under this regional program, thereby allowing us to you know, connect national interventions to uh, 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 global ones and regional ones. So it will be very, very good for us under the SDG Accelerator Lab, of course, to look at the recommendations that have come through the ICT Advisory Committee as it uh, winds down its work and see how we can certainly give velocity and momentum uh, to those uh, areas of gap, uh, whether it's on the policy side or on the downstream implementation side that, that can enable uh, these innovators to really thrive and, and, and grow their businesses to uh, the, 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 the scale that we would like as a, a real model for building uh, uh, forward better. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you so much, uh, Walid. Uh, in the meantime, I encourage my panelists to look at the Q&A and see if they can respond. Um, uh, I will also be, and I think Walid will not mind this, uh, if the Secretary can also avail a way within which we can be contacted for, for the initiatives that we've mentioned, uh, of course, in a very structured manner to see how we can take forward the recommendations. And talking about the 4IR <laughs> and private sector, let me introduce Dr. Elsie Kanza, the head of Africa for the World Economic Forum, as we transition to the private sector phase of this conversation. Elsie. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, and, and thanks to uh, the previous speakers who I will very much echo as, as I share uh, an initiative that we've been supporting at the forum um, called the Africa Growth Platform. So allow me to begin with the, with the trigger uh, for the Africa Growth Platform. Um, according to the World Economic Forum Regional Risk Report in 2019, uh, surveyed CEOs considered Africa's biggest risk, youth unemployment and underemployment. Uh, this was quite distinct compared to other regions in the world where climate change uh, was the leading risk, according to the CEOs in those regions. Uh, with this backdrop, over 400 million youth in Africa, uh, two thirds are unemployed and discouraged. So clearly um, a major challenge to contend with. A 2020 Africa Youth Survey 
um, more positively indicates that despite these challenges, more than 70% of African youth say that they would like to start their own business uh, within the next or over the next uh, five years. This is echoed uh, by the World Bank that uh, found that Africa was the most entrepreneurial continent in the world. The challenge is that African SMEs, MSMEs struggle to thrive, struggle to scale. Uh, they stay micro, it's, uh, it's estimated that they're about 100 million MSMEs, and the majority of them are micro, meaning that they have less than, than 10 employees. The, the main challenge that underscores all of this is what it means for job creation in, in the continent, given that small businesses are, are the biggest employers worldwide. With this context in mind, the Africa Growth Platform was launched uh, in September 2019 at the World Economic Forum and Africa meeting held in Cape Town last September. It is a big business response uh, to create jobs by deliberately and intentionally partnering with small businesses in their supply chains, for instance, all value chains or as service providers. So it's a B2B solution by and large. It is also an ecosystem approach seeking to foster collaboration and coordinate ongoing interventions by key stakeholders, including governments, investors and educators. This very much echoes what was said by Chair Mercy Wanjiao about the need to tackle the fragmentation uh, that is currently underway. The first phase of the Africa Growth Platform consisted of mapping the priority needs of the SMEs and startups uh, in particular, that was the initial focus, as well as mobilizing stakeholder support. And, and this was key because we also found in um, speaking to our various constituents that a lot of the interventions were on the supply side, they were supply side driven, not demand side driven. Uh, so the, yes, there's an overlap, but a question of uh, prioritization um, was not consistent uh, from the SME startup side vis-a-vis -vis those stakeholders seeking to support them. In January 2020 in Davos, we launched the Davos Friends of the Africa Growth Platform, which is a community galvanizing global support to meet the AGP target of scaling 100 million SMEs and startups by 2025. So that was uh, all good and we were to, to be on the right track and then COVID-19 happened and uh, in March April as we're preparing uh, to support countries in rolling out their national platforms uh, we had to pivot due to the COVID-19 pandemic and then the big challenge was how to support MSMEs uh, to survive not not no longer scaling but really just to make it through um, the crisis as an organization the World Economic Forum launched the Regional Action Group for Africa to guide all of our support to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and particularly with respect to the Africa Growth Platform, we established a COVID-19 small business support network, essentially repurposing the community that we had already begun to build out uh, to focus on this uh, very deliberate and urgent task. What has been the impact thus far? Under the Small Business Support Network, uh, the AGP focused on channeling various global solutions to help MSMEs uh, survive, as I mentioned. I'd like to uh, um, acknowledge and thank the kickoff by the Honorable C.S. Mushero in May uh, for one particular initiative, the Coursera Workforce Recovery Initiative. Coursera is a champion of the forum's reskilling revolution. Through this initiative, they partnered with governments to provide free access to about 3,800 online causes. It is time bound. Uh, by the end of September, which was the deadline for governments to sign up, we had about 12 governments that made it, Ethiopia, Equatorial Guinea, Kenya, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Somaliland, South Africa, and Uganda. So as we speak, we have thousands of citizens that are able to um, make the best of a wide array of, of digital skilling. Uh, I would like to make a appeal and a call for action because the deadline for citizens to sign up is the end of October and then the program uh, will expire at the end of this year. It's very much targeted as a special intervention uh, to deal and, and essentially sail through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic peak period. 
The second initiative I'd like to highlight is an EDSI digital transformation for public servants. Uh, this is championed by a World Economic Forum technology pioneer and seeks to equip civil servants with critical skills to support what has been an upside of COVID-19 in Africa, which is essentially accelerating the digital transformation agenda. Ethiopia and Rwanda have already signed up and other conversations are ongoing with various governments that see the need to boost the skills, uh, particularly of the middle management and really the, the civil servants that, um, that the public needs to interface with on a day-to-day -day basis. We also held experience sharing workshops with the Alibaba eFounder Fellows and, and Babson College. And I seem to recognize some, some of the participating entrepreneurs uh, present on this call. Uh, we thank you for sharing your experience. In particular, one of the striking findings was having some of the entrepreneurs say that COVID-19 was a blessing in disguise. Um, they saw policymakers undertake uh, radical reforms literally overnight that helped them to boost their business, but also play an active role in supporting their countries to make it through the crisis. Um, without suffering. So it's, so it's been a very interesting dynamic vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the rest of the world and certainly what we're seeing here in, in Europe. So where do we go from here? Uh, now that we're starting to live with, with COVID-19, uh, a big concern is how we uh, build uh, forward stronger and in particular resilience. So yes, continue to support MSMEs, but really with a resilience lens. And in this regard, uh, in September, the Regional Action Group for Africa launched an initiative to shape a resilient MSME, MSME landscape by 2030. And part of this entails building a resilience framework uh, for sustainable business models. Again, uh, some of the issues raised, particularly the key elements uh, by Chairman Wanjiao, uh, certainly uh, Chairperson Wanjiao certainly resonate uh, with the, some of the ideas that are put forward. And in this regard, I'd like to highlight uh, a major continental initiative that we're now embarking uh, to build upon that also emerged during this COVID-19 crisis. And that is the African Union Development Agency's um, MSME support program. It's an ambitious program to revolutionize uh, continental capabilities to support MSMEs. It's focusing on, on three uh, key areas underpinned by a common digital platform. One is MSME Academy, two is an MSME Marketplace, and lastly, MSME Finance. And here, just building on the point that was made earlier about the need to mobilize capital, they're looking at uh, very practical and innovative ways of looking at this problem, not so much by channeling direct funding, but by establishing a guarantee fund and working with among other central banks with a target of extending at least $5 billion of financing to MSMEs in the, across the continent uh, over the next 18 months. And then overall, the aim is to reach and register 1 million MSMEs, accounting for at least 1 million jobs by the end of 2021. In conclusion, I'm personally encouraged by this uh, collective renewed efforts to combine forces. Uh, let's make them count at the end of the day uh, the results will be borne by the impact that we will have on the MSMEs across the continent. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elsie, as always, being very succinct. Um, just to mention that, again, to reiterate the call on the Coursera Workforce Recovery Initiative, we have a deadline. It's October 31, it is free of charge. Uh, please, uh, I suggest that you contact the Ministry of ICT. Uh, it was being signed through the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, through the Ajira program. So I suggest you do that, but I think we'll try and avail that information to the Secretariat. Uh, quickly, let me transition over to Susan, <laughs> Jaraga from Stanley Chattenberg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for having uh, us as a bank on this call. I know, um, Philip, like you said at the beginning, um, some of the innovators on the call must be wondering what we were doing here. But I think the important point is for us to be able to highlight um, the role that banks are playing and the role that private sector is playing in helping to, to drive innovation for micro and small businesses. So just to set context, um, Standard Chartered's ambition is to be the most responsible and sustainable bank in Kenya. And we look at it in three areas. The first area is around sustainable finance, which is really our core business of lending. So, for example, you know, 
not many people may be aware, but last year we injected about 12 billion shillings into uh, micro and small businesses in Kenya directly and indirectly. The second area is around our operations, so ourselves, how we operate financial crime compliance, conduct the people we have on our teams. And I think uh, COVID was very timely in showing everybody when you're on the front foot of already beginning your digital transformation and journey, you were able to push through this difficult situation. But it also pushed companies like ourselves and many others to really look at technology and the investment around it to be more significant. So the ability for colleagues to work from home, but more importantly as well, the investment that needs to come when you're a business that's leveraging technology, the investment that needs to come behind your cybersecurity and protection. Um, and then the third area um, that we look at when we talk about uh, sustainability and innovation is around tackling inequality. And from um, my fellow panelists from the beginning until my side, I think that's an area inevitably that we have to all look to address and the SDGs. There we have a particular program, an incubation program called Women in Tech Incubator Program. It's specifically looking at women-led startups. And over the past three years, we've invested 20, sorry, 50 million shillings in over 30 startup organizations. These are women-led, they're leveraging technology and they're solving for a sustainable development goal. So I think a key question um, that inevitably comes up when you have private sector and potentially a bank on this uh, type of conversation is, what role are you guys playing in all of this? <laughs> what value can you bring to the table? So I think, um, first of all, there's definitely no denying that the financial sector must and has an integral role to play in providing a, a financial system that drives innovation and development, be it in Kenya or anywhere else um, in the world. Looking at that, Standard Chartered have um, an arm of our business, which is called SC Ventures. And the role of that uh, arm of our business is to promote innovation and invest in disruptive financial technology that explores different alternative models. And we do this because we're fully cognizant that the traditional models of banking and the traditional financial systems must evolve to start serving the society and the technology driven uh, economies that we're becoming. So this arm of the business partners with different fintechs to launch um, diverse projects using technology that ranges from AI to IoT to blockchain. So for example, we're currently working um, on a smart metering solution um, that will um, help uh, a public, you know, a, a county with uh, public water and sanitation to improve how they, they track and monitor their, their water. The other one I think that I talked about was really the need to, to rethink access to capital um, and how we um, how the financial sector looks at that. Um, it's a totally different model when you're talking to a, a tech innovator and their, their asset um, is an app or an algorithm or is in their head or is in their laptop. You can't ask the traditional uh, credit questions that you've been asking. And we're very cognizant of that. And that's where for us, um, our Women in Tech Incubation Program is also helping us as a business to start thinking in a different, different way. Because we know that startups need a different kind of support. We know that small, medium-sized businesses need a different kind of support. And we're actually changing our credit and our risk approaches to take that into consideration. Um, there was a recent survey that was done by PwC, and 90% of the leaders of financial services says one of their biggest challenges is going to be around um, the innovations and speed of uh, technology. And so being cognizant of that fact, uh, there's a lot of catch up to be done in the governance structures, in the compliance structures, in the fact that technology makes everything so global and international and fast that you know, the traditional things that were in place for the industry have to change. Um, that's uh, clear and without saying. And I think it's really pushing us to do that. 
The other third area that I would like to touch on is it's really important that uh, the innovators who are out there uh, really start looking at the sustainable development goals, not as a societal or environmental issue, but as a business opportunity. And one of the things that we're doing as a bank, consciously taking the decision to say, we are going to be proactively pursuing and supporting clients that are driving a positive social and environmental impact. Why is that? Because that social sort of environmental impact is where the need, the market, and the demand is created. So really looking at the SDGs as a business opportunity and not just as a societal opportunity. Because that's, I mean, the fact that there's an SDG issue means that there is a market and that there is a need for a product or a solution that has to be delivered. And so maybe to conclude, I'd say that, um, you know, just on the investment part and looking at the SDGs, earlier this year, we released a SDG investment opportunity map. And just for Kenya alone, there's an investment opportunity of USD 10.3 billion just for digital access. 9 billion when we look at uh, power and more overall across three SDGs there's 40 billion of investment opportunity. And our question is now to start asking, who are the clients or who are the partners that we can bring in that can really help us to drive that SDG agenda, to drive real development that creates, creates value. So um, summarizing it very shortly, for sure, uh, financial institutions have a significant role to play. We don't have all the answers. Um, I think, just like everybody else, um, technology is pushing us to move faster, um, but we are moving as fast as we can and realizing that, um, that our existing models need to adapt to fit, you know, the businesses that are today that are startups and those big businesses that they will become in the future. Um, a quick call to action on our women in tech uh, incubator program. It's a program we run with IBIS Africa. It's actually launching the fourth cohort this Thursday, so October 15th, and the application process will run until December 15th. So if there are any women startup entrepreneurs on this call um, or in this meeting that are already tech enabled, uh, it could be a startup of two, three years and less or a business idea, please do apply to our program. Your participation when you are selected is a three to four month incubation. And we also provide you with um, seed funding um, if you make it to the final five of one million shillings each. And we continue to work with you to test your model for success. So yeah, thank you for, for the time. I really look forward to um, hearing the showcase. And I think there may be some questions in the chat, so I'll respond to those um, as we move to the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, and, and thank you for this part of the panel. Uh, it was quite informative, and I like that it had goodies. Uh, so I think if people are listening, there's a lot of things to latch on to. But the sense that I'm getting is that each panelist is a potential webinar. So potentially, then I'd, I'd really hope and encourage the, the committee as much as it's rolling. Uh, it's coming to an end. We still have institutions like the Communication Authority of Kenya and the Ministry of ICT to see how to work with us to do uh, more conversations like this. Uh, and I also see synergies between UNDP, World Economic Forum, and Standard Chartered because we seem to be working uh, on the same thing. So how do we collaborate? Uh, let us move quickly into the showcase. And I know the first one has to come very quickly because they had a hard stop. Uh, let me introduce... Um, Ha, a collaboration between the South Africa Space Agency and Zindi. Um, Celine, you have the floor. Um, and and this one was actually going to share the slides. Is and this one on? Um, absolutely, I'm on. Uh, good afternoon. 
So I'm just going to take the first few um, the first few slides and then give uh, over to to, to Salini uh, in the true call of collaboration because this is this is what uh, this is what this was. So I hope everyone can see our slides. So with the South African Space Agency, uh, we have two mandates that I think are relevant to this conversation today. One one part of our mandate is to make sure that we support government uh, in its um, um, endeavors for to provide service delivery to the people of South Africa. The second one is our contribution to the economic growth uh, through industry development. So when we were hit by COVID-19, we had, um, we, we dig deep in terms of the satellite archive imagery that we have. We have coverage that goes over four decades that covers South Africa. Uh, one of the major challenges that we've had over the, over the time was how we actually appropriately exploit all of this uh, imagery. So the imaging technologies like your artificial intelligence and machine learning are quite critical for the exploitation of this, uh, of this imagery. When COVID-19 hit, uh, we engaged our industry to look at what were the products and services that firstly industry had that could be immediately be deployed uh, for government usage. At the second level, we also looked at what are the things that we're needing to be developed, uh, especially looking at post-COVID-19 uh, provisions as well. So here on this slide, I'm only mentioning about three group of areas, one being the movement of people. And the most interesting aspect into this was when locked hit South Africa, we then needed, and we were locked down within the provinces. What the National Disaster Management Center was interested in was uh, are people actually staying within provinces or not? And so geospatial technology and geospatial information was able, we were able to use this to actually support the, the disaster management. Um, air quality movement uh, was, was, was the one, carbon dioxide and, uh, uh, and so forth, to track those. And we can see that as soon as lockdown happened, uh, our skies started to clear, the air quality started to clear over certain uh, population areas. Um, but the most interesting one, of course, was the human settlement layers, the information that government needed to figure out uh, how to provide services and resources uh, to people, in particular, the most disadvantaged of our communities and, um, and the most vulnerable of our communities that are are in the informal settlements. And our mechanism so far has been manual mechanisms for doing this. The second aspect of that was the informal economy, because as you would know, our countries, we've got these two sets of economies, your formal economy and the informal com uh, uh, economy. And the informal economy tends to be again aligned with the most vulnerable of our communities. So we then looked at the industries to see who we can partner with to actually improve our products and services around this. And we found uh, Zindi and and thanks also to uh, to Philip for the introduction early on, uh, you know, um, African African style, as you would say. So we then met up with uh, with Zindi and also the Amazon uh, Web Service uh, to to look at how we could improve the informal settlement uh, mapping uh, for the Department of Human Settlements as well as for the Department of Small Business. So I will hand over to Zindi uh, to Selina at this point uh, to talk about the hackathon that we then launched. Great, thank you. Uh, um, hi, so I'm Selena. I'm the CEO of Zindi. Zindi's a startup, uh, but we're really an a online community of data scientists that are solving important problems like the ones that Andy Sway was talking about. Uh, we run data science challenges and we invite our community of over 20,000 data scientists from across Africa and around the world to solve them uh, using machine learning and AI. So we were really excited um, when Andiswa reached out to us. Thank you, Philip, for the introduction. And um, you know, as someone earlier said, COVID kind of opened up all these other ways of thinking about problems or, or you know, reprioritize the problems that we have. So it was really exciting to be able to um, help Sansa uh, tackle the challenges that they had in terms of being able to make the process more efficient in terms of identifying where the informal settlements are across the country in South Africa. So the, the challenge that we launched on Zindi uh, had the objective of developing a machine learning model that could take in the high resolution satellite imagery that Sansa is collecting and to uh, develop a machine learning model that would automate the process of identifying where those informal settlements are down to the GPS coordinates. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
So we ran this challenge in, uh, with the support of AWS um, over a two-day period, a Saturday and a Sunday. We invited our top data scientists. Out of the 20,000 data scientists we have on our platform, we invited the top 200 to, um, to join this hackathon over, over the weekend. And you can see that we got really great global coverage. I mean, not just coverage within Africa, but also around the world. Um, this gives you a sense of the different countries that people came from. We had nearly 200 data scientists um, come in with nearly 200 unique solutions that were submitted. Um, and you go to the next slide to give you an illustration of what the what the product ends up looking like is essentially you have these types of satellite imagery that SANS is collecting and how do you make sense of that? How do you make it more, uh, you know, a quicker and almost more real time process of identifying where are the informal settlements and what's nice about in the picture on the right hand side that shows you more or less what the what the results look like and you can see that this gives you an example of two different types of um, settlements, uh, the, the blue part on the it kind of going down the middle is where you can see that the the rooftops are a little bit more closer together they're smaller they're a little less structured and that's where the algorithm is actually picking up that these are more likely informal settlements as opposed to the housing that you see in the bottom right hand corner so just to give you an illustration of what the output actually looks like um, so just in conclusion i mean this is just one example of the types of problems that we're talking to samsa about about tackling together uh, and I think what's really exciting is showing how you can leverage these brilliant minds that are across Africa, around the world, um, and matching them up with, with these problems that they love to solve and are actually really well positioned to solve. There. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Celine. And just a plug again, I think um, between ourselves and the South Africa Space Agency, we are part of a, of a $24 million initiative called Digital Earth Africa that provides uh, analysis ready data uh, for, for Africans. So again, would potentially ask you to get in touch with myself or Andiswa as a co-chair of the Technical Advisory Group, but also Zindi is open to collaboration, including with Kenyans, uh, plus the 20,000 um, data scientists. Um, and there's a lot to, to learn from them. But also I know that Zindi did work also on Kenya. So I think you potentially want to share with the committee um, the, the hackathon results of what you did, even in South Africa, that you thought had impact or implications on Kenya. Again, I request that we ask uh, Andiswa and uh, Celine, again, women, yay, in space, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how they did it and potentially how we can collaborate. Uh, quickly, let me move to another lady. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there's a bias in this one. Uh, um, Tule uh, from the Agriculture Transformation Office back here in Kenya. Tule, are you there? To share a presentation. <laughs> We didn't hear you. I'm Philip. Sorry. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. And it's quite a big panel, 120 participants. Um, so I would also like to do a presentation. If I can share screen, can be allowed to share screen, I will just, I'll do so just now. Um, just hold on. Oh, dear. Was I unmuted or muted by the host? <laughs> no, you're good. We, we can hear you. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll try and keep mine to the five minutes that I was allotted, um, even though it's quite a, it's a, quite a number of um, uh, slides. So just to give you a quick overview, I'm, my name is Tule Linnea. I am the Agriculture Transformation um, Office Coordinator who works for um, the CS, who is our Minister in Agriculture. And I'm gonna have a quick, I'll just give a quick rundown of how we're looking at digital transformation in agriculture, especially in the context um, of COVID. So ours is based on our ASTGS, which is our Agriculture Sector Transformation Growth Strategy, which is our 10 year plan um, of developing the uh, sector from to, into a commercially viable and modern agricultural sector. And that obviously requires for us to have um, digital interventions. Um, this is based on our nine flagships um, and specifically with regards to build, building resiliency and sustainability um, 
using digital tools, we have a number of flagships that are focused on that. The first one being our e-voucher program, um, which is to register 1.4 million farmers to then receive support directly from government and as well as creating, um, strengthening our research and innovation and launching a number of priority digital use cases. I'm just giving the background just for a bit of understanding and context understanding. And out of the ASTGS, we have seven digital use cases as I explained, one of them being the e-voucher program, um, and then mostly to ensure that we um, create cross-cutting support across our, you know, our partners, stakeholders, um, as well as our ag sector ministries, because it's important that we increase our coordination from being the silo thinking, which um, Madam Chairperson actually mentioned earlier in her meet uh, in her presentation, um, as the Agriculture Transformation Office, we're responsible for increasing that collaboration across within the ministry and then across um, our stakeholders. So how did we respond to COVID-19? Um, so um, at the onset, we established the food security war room, which allowed for us to um, coordinate across 50 stakeholders. In fact, I think in the end, when we were at our biggest, it was 90 stakeholders. And we had stakeholders and partner, um, counterpart, but also development partners and NGOs, which included AGRA, which was um, um, significant support provided to us uh, to make sure that we established the food security war room, um, as well as Thunderbird, um, um, in terms of ensuring that we then had systems in place uh, to ensure that we could actually record the data um, with regards to food availability, pricing and accessibility. So when we had our partial shutdown in Kenya, um, it, uh, it, it affected the ability for service providers to deliver food to the markets because unlike a lot of other uh, more structured economies, uh, Kenya's access to food is mostly through what we call mamambogas, um, which is a small kiosk um, that then is supplied with fresh produce on a daily basis. And that requires for them to still have availability of produce on a daily basis to then make sure that their communities are still fed. And this was what we then, um, um, what we were, what we uh, followed through on in terms of um, assessing. But in the COVID context, we also were struggling with the desert locust. We've had the largest desert locust impact uh, in the last 60 years in Kenya. So um, with COVID we were compounded or rather the locusts compounded by COVID because they came after, um, COVID came after our locust um, issues. So we, it, was, it pushed the ministry to implement a number of digital initiatives that could then one, um, uh, surveil and respond to the challenges that um, counties were facing with regards to um, desert locusts, but also um, our food balance sheet in terms of how it affected our stocks. Um, we've been implementing a test version of um, the digital food balance sheet, which looks at stock, which was also affected by our desert locusts. Um, production, which allows for forecasting of the season's um, expected production. Trade, which is our formal informal flows, both uh, within the country as in across counties, but also with our neighboring, um, you know, we are a, a major part of the EAC, um, East Africa um, um, Commission, but uh, we have op very open borders with regards to grain um, uh, trade. Then consumption, uh, which was expected maize consumption by the region. And we've mostly focused on maize as our first value chain that we're assessing because it is our staple crop or staple food. And then of course the food balance, which is the net effect of all the supply and demand drivers um, so that we can understand our current um, status with regards to our strategic food reserves. And this is available with, through one of our parastatals, which is Calro and it's fbs.calro.org. So out of the food security war room, using uh, information from um, the digital food balance sheet, we have created digital um, dashboards and we're currently in the create, like re um, refining them so that it ensures that we are providing the most accurate information with regards to crop availability, livestock and fish, because agriculture is not just, you know, our crop value chains, it's across uh, livestock and fisheries. Um, and currently the food security war room has now um, it's in the pr process of transitioning from being a disaster response to a more um, uh, sustainable um, monitoring committee with regards to uh, our, our food availability price 
um, and access. And so we can only do that by having the digital platforms and tools deployed um, across our 47 counties to ensure that the data is collected appropriately and on time, and that they can then be visualized in um, using uh, AI. So we have partnered with uh, Microsoft on this in particular, but as well as Esri, also thanks to Philip. So I guess Philip is our main uh, connector across all of us here um, to ensure that we then could uh, visualize this data, but also then um, assess what, what the impact our interventions were having with regards to access to food, its pricing um, and availability across the country. Um, oh, it looks like my uh, presentation ended. I did have one more slide with regards to our um, asks, especially, um, um, in response to our sustainability and resilience of these challenges. Um, just sorry about that. Interesting. Okay. So it looks like it's my Zoom platform has failed a little bit, Philip, so I'm just going to carry on. See, these are the challenges that we face um, <laughs> about responding, uh, working in the digital environment is that you have to roll with the punches with these um, issues. Um, one more slide, here it is. So finally for us, uh, similar to, um, as mentioned by Madam Chairperson, there are a number of challenges and solutions that we need to have addressed, right? So the skills for us is, has been glaringly obvious in terms of the ability for our staff to be able to respond and then effectively work using a digitally enabled work environment. So we need to be able to then have to um, respond to the retooling requirements and increase collaboration with the private sector because clearly um, a lot of the response and our ability to effectively respond to the challenges uh, some communities were facing with regards to food accessibility came from the private sector. And we have understood, especially coming from our minister's office, is that government should not be in the business of operations, we should be in the business of creating the enabling environment that allows the private sector to then do the work and we just make sure we support rather than prevent them from being able to do so. So this is what we're talking about in terms of the enabling environment. But the enabling environment is not just for how we affect our stakeholders, but in terms of our internal stakeholders as ourselves as ministry. The steering committee is great, but it's always temporary. So we need to look at having a more comprehensive enabling environment from our ICT counterparts. And I know I'm always um, having, trying to have a chat with Pierce or Chiang on this, um, as well as Philip, in terms of now looking at how do you build partnerships? You know, government can't do this by itself. Um, you know, and even though uh, COVID-19 support um, was extraordinary, it was only temporary. So we need to now look at the longer term partnerships and collaborative interventions that are required to support continued digitization of the sector. We want to increase the youth participation. Um, so part of that requires you to have a more open culture with regards to innovation and receiving it. So currently we know that our government structures stifle innovation. I'm from government, so I can say it. Um, and so we need to deploy more flexible arrangements or engagements to allow like the through flow of innovations to and within government. Um, I also have come from previously working in the private sector and understanding that um, tech uh, talent also changes quite a bit. Um, the tech in itself is also always um, morphing um, and we need to be able to then, no government will maybe not be able to keep up in terms of what's happening currently, but at least not, let's not be so far behind that it takes us a long time to ramp up um, the digitization um, of our workplace. But um, so we were very fortunate that we've had quite a few um, number of um, very responsive partners, like I said, um, that have helped us um, with consultants that are you know, working towards uh, uh, making sure that we have a properly digitally enabled workplace. But we want that to be sustainable. And we now need to figure out how to ensure that the resources are available um, and, and realigning our budgets towards creating that robust um, digitally enabled workplace away from the physical um, interventions and now towards our digital interventions. Um, I think, yes, that is where I end. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Tule. Um, and when I say Philip, please remember it's a Thunderbird School <laughs> of Global Management and Arizona State University. This is what 
a 21st century university should do, uh, um, connect nodes of knowledge, but also see how to catalyze change, be very practical. And so I think for us, yes, thank you. <laughs> and I think for us having a, having a regional office in Nairobi is just a blessing. And, and we are very fortunate to have partners, including the government of Kenya, but also our other Africa colleagues to see how we can collaboratively uh, lead or Africa leading the fourth industrial revolution. Anybody who has questions for Tule, Tule is always open to conversations. Again, Q&A and chat. Let me go quickly to, I see Mark Levy has come on. <laughs> this will be Grid 3 and Sugo Foundation. And uh, let's go to West Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Philip, and um, friends and colleagues. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. OK. Um, so I will give a, um, uh, a short presentation, and then my colleague will will complete it. Um, we are talking about our experience in Grid Three, which is a partnership devoted to providing access to high resolution population settlement boundary and facility data to solve development problems. Our experience with regard to COVID nineteen um, data interventions. The, the way we approached the COVID-19 challenge was informed very heavily by our experience supporting interventions aimed at improving immunization outcomes. This work began in Nigeria. It's now underway in many other uh, Sub-Saharan African countries. Um, in brief, the Nigeria experience taught us that no matter how strongly we want to jump straight to the fourth industrial revolution and focus on building data ecosystems that achieve all of the um, high ambition integration and transformation goals that we care about. If you do not have in place um, the simple building blocks that were created in the earlier industrial revolutions, um, it will be very, very hard to succeed, if not impossible. And so the, the efforts to eradicate polio in Northern Nigeria ran into repeated difficulties because they lacked simple information about the location of people. They lacked the ability to delineate the management areas of people responsible for delivering vaccines. Um, they didn't know where all the villages and towns were. And so a, a rapid effort to put those layers in place um, led to uh, a reversal of the increase in wild polio cases and eventually culminating in the declaration of Nigeria as polio free um, earlier this year. The success there led very rapidly to spreading the same innovations to other um, immunization campaigns, first measles, then the then yellow fever, and now all routine immunizations are using these same data innovations because they work. Uh, the success drives um, diffusion. So other sectors are now picking up the same things and success drives adoption by the government. So in the course of two and a half years, uh, the Grid 3 Nigeria is turning over the entire operation to the Nigerian government. Um, it's one of the fastest transfers I've seen of a, of a major innovation like that. Um, and then, so COVID-19, um, we emphasized the availability of innovative ways using all the fancy data science, uh, data collection technologies, machine learning, many of the things that have been discussed earlier to harness those to produce a very old fashioned set of data sets, uh, location of people, uh, location of settlements and so on. Um, and to pull them together as fast as possible to meet um, COVID-19 response needs. The table summarizes where we've been active. I'll just highlight a few of the lessons. Um, some of the lessons were expected that when you have these data sets available in an accessible open platform, 
People can do things like promote better social distancing, monitoring and regulation. Um, they can get a better handle on where mobility uh, presents opportunities and challenges and so on. Um, but there were many unexpected lessons as well. Um, one was that um, the, you know, we'd expected a big focus on the public health related data sets. It, every government was very, very interested in looking beyond health at the downstream impacts from the pandemic and wanting spatial data sets related to um, unemployment, to food security, and so on. And so we've been rapidly trying to help meet those needs. Um, and then a third unexpected lesson was the simple act of putting up a, an open, accessible, spatial data hub helped drive rapid increase in demand for more data, in demand for applications making use of these data, and for interest, serious interest, in pursuing integrated data solutions to complex problems. So what we found is that just putting up a data hub, which can be done very quickly, um, had more impact than hundreds or thousands of workshops trying to promote the merits of these kinds of, um, of activities. And then just finally, one sad lesson is that a lot of the ambitions the governments came to us with that they were hoping our data solutions would address could not be met because there was insufficient prior investment in just basic data infrastructure. Um, the, the most common um, deficiency in the baseline data had to do with spatial information about health facilities. Um, this, you can't make that data gap up in the course of a few weeks. That takes more like a few months. And, and so that was a, a sad reminder that there's some basic catch up that we have to do if we're going to achieve the full potential of all the innovations we're talking about today. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mark. But that's, I think, just also to acknowledge that um, the work of Grid 3 would not have been possible um, without the Global Partnership on Sustainable Development Data. Oh, yes. We've been collaborating a lot. <laughs> thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> At scale, um, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Honorable Rachel Omamo, is actually our board member. So we are really fortunate to have the Global Partnership here we have about two Kenyans as part of the FAD partnership. I know Karen is on the call and Dev is on the call, but then it opens up opportunities for collaboration. Uh, so can we have um, Nigeria presentation continue? Mute. <laughs> Thanks Lola. <laughs> I was wondering why you weren't answering. <laughs> um, hello, Philip. Uh, I'd also like to share my presentation, please. Um, if I can, am I able to do that? Okay, excellent. So, good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, it is nice to be here to talk to everyone. And um, I'm a little under the weather today, so excuse any sort of pauses, um, but I'd like to uh, run through my presentation uh, just very quickly talking about uh, the coronavirus uh, response hub that we have. Before I start, actually, I also like to say hello to, to Elsie, which I, who I haven't, I haven't seen in quite a while. So hi, Elsie. Um, so just going quickly, um, MBS, I wanted to share this because it's important to the success um, of, of the hub. Um, we are the National Statistics Office in Nigeria, um, and we have offices in every uh, state uh, and the FCT. Um, and we also have six zonal offices and uh, we are the coordinator of the National Statistical System. And, um, to also mention some of the key roles that, that precipitated our involvement. Sorry, I'm just going to try and move this. Um, for MBS during the pandemic uh, to provide key social economic indicators. Um, we also had the National Longitudinal Food Survey, uh, which is done in conjunction with the World Bank. 
but there was also increased demand across uh, federal government MDAs uh, for data specifically to inform like fiscal and monetary and also the public health response. Um, and we felt a strong uh, responsibility to be able to collate and disseminate COVID-19 data um, on one central platform because we had a situation where data was coming from from everywhere, um, but there was no no central location where the public and or even the CSOs can go um, to get uh, data about the response. And the key policy enablers for us at MBS was that MBS actually has a constitutional mandate to collect data from any MDA um, across the country, both for subnational and national uh, level as well. Um, and also we, MBS as an agency, was under the Ministry of Finance budget and national planning, which also hosts the Greek 3 project uh, that Mark, Mark was talking about earlier. So there was really a good synergy early on and good buying earlier on um, with the government and using Grid 3 data. Um, and MBS is also represented on the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, so we also have access to data that's generated through that task force. And in, in, in general, MBS enjoys a goodwill, both with the public and internally within the government um, MDAs. Um, we've really worked over the last six, seven years on providing timely data, accurate data, transparency. So we were really in a great position um, to leverage on, on um, our capacity within the agency. Now, for the timeline, we initially uh, were contacted by GPSDD um, in April about a po po possible partnerships uh, across uh, both private and public sector partnerships in Africa, outside of Africa. And we were really excited about this. Particularly, we were excited about the opportunity to, to use uh, spatial technology, geospatial data, and to be able to showcase um, the spread um, using Grid3 data as well. So that started out in, in, in um, April, and just to show the progression, the quick progression um, from April to June when we actually launched the website. So it, it did take a few months, um, and in that time we had garnered, garnered um, partnerships with quite a few key partners and we launched. Since then, we've also added obviously some other information. I believe uh, Sergo Foundation is gonna present later on. Um, we were working with Imperial University as well um, and uh, Oxford University as well on some of the data that they've done. Um, and we really just wanted it to be a one-stop shop for everything related to COVID and the response in Nigeria. I've mentioned it, Mark has given a presentation on it just now, but really it couldn't have been done without grade three um, and a lot of the work that has already been done, particularly in, uh, in reference to polio or ma mapping out um, healthcare or schools. Uh, as I mentioned here, there's about 500,000 points of interest in Nigeria that was already mapped and georeferenced. So it was really, easy for us to take some of the data such as uh, treatment centers or isolation centers and match it up with data that's already available using Grid3. Um, and ESRI, uh, which uh, is the international supplier for geographic information system, uh, through ArcGIS, obviously they provided a lot of help handholding training for our staff. Um, troubleshooting and um, improving the just the general process of us finding data and how best to display that data uh, for for the use of, of the public and of government and of course uh, the the Nigerian Center for Disease and Control uh, which was managing the pandemic and is the public health agency in Nigeria um, it's a key relationship, obviously, but it's also a very challenging relationship because there, there are several challenges about data sharing, how quickly that data can be shared, how quickly can that data be uploaded, um, issues of data ownership. Um, so there was a lot of tussle that we had to go through, um, while, and we still actually go through um, in terms of making data um, available on the pandemic. So this is just the general structure of the hub. 
we focused on just three um, key areas, which is linking pages to official government data, sources for response activities, monetary response, um, movement, um, self-assessment, uh, guidance, and all of that. And uh, the second part is a compilation of available dashboards that were created by MDAs or research institutions or private sector organizations. And we've really tried to partner, this is where we've really tried to partner with organizations, both locally and internationally, um, outside of government who have been doing analysis or who have GIS capacity. Um, we also reached out to uh, data scientists um, from the Nigerian diaspora. So we have um, interns that are working on it from, from the UK and from the US just to help us um, utilize uh, the, the, the tools that ArcGIS provides. And we also have uh, the analyzed data, mainly using grid three data, like I mentioned, um, using incidence data, socioeconomic data and health indicators to really provide a robust overview um, of, of um, the incidents and um, the response. So some of the impacts and results, um, I get asked that a lot. It's hard to quantify. Um, we do know that, you know, we can look at the site visits, but we know that that doesn't tell the whole story. So for example, we, the, the dashboard precipitated, the task force dashboard, they didn't have one before, but seeing, and we had to work with them and also train them um, using some of our partnerships with Esri. Um, seeing the usefulness of that, um, they were also able to provide a lot more information about resource and capacity use, um, which is unprecedented um, from a committee at that level to be able to provide real-time data and information. Um, there's also a greater awareness of the rate of infection across Nigeria and the resources deployed in the re response, including financial resources. And there's been greater demand within government in Nigeria. Uh, for, for that centralized information. We've had communication also from donor agencies about um, specific further research um, on the impact of COVID on agriculture, on businesses, on small businesses, on, on young people, on women. So we've had a lot of interest generated just from having um, the data hub. Uh, the other one is the interest um, in geospatial units, creating one within our NSO, which we didn't have before. And we've already had initial discussions with partners um, in terms of furthering our geospatial capacity within the Bureau of Statistics. And it, this is a particularly significant doc, uh, development. Uh, without COVID-19, I think someone else said, <laughs> Um, given the effects of the pandemic, there was still some blessing within it. And this would be really the main blessing for us is that we're able now um, to, to pursue having this unit within the National Statistics Office. Um, and post COVID, that, that's really the first, the first uh, thing where we would be working on, um, continuation of collaboration with Esri, obviously um, in terms of grid three, we're also now quite, quite invested in, 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 in the outputs of that. So I see us continuing along that part, path and um, just epidemic and disease information post COVID. Um, we had a Lassa fever outbreak just just earlier in the year, it's still ongoing, which MBS wasn't tracking at all previously. So we now have the tools to do that, to be able to provide more robust information um, on that. So the key learnings, I'll just wrap up very quickly. Uh, the key learnings was, was that um, the response is, is to both the health and the socioeconomic um, impact requires vast amount of data and data coordination. And while data coordination is always, you know, a challenge, it really was evident how, how much we have to work towards that on data ownership and things like that, because they really got in the way. Um, obviously, geospatial and mobile data increasingly relevant, especially when you're talking about a national statistic um, office. Um, we tried with this, for example, to look at mobility data, but we had some challenges within our government about um, some policy around the use of mo uh, mobile, mobile information. So that obviously brings up a new set of uh, policy 
uh, outlook that we need to work on um, to be able to provide better uh, georeferenced uh, data. And also it just brought out the importance of the National Statistics Office as a key partner um, in national planning because nobody else and there was nowhere else where you could actually have the mandate to aggregate information and provide it in real time, accessible to everybody, transparent and accessible. So I think for us, those are, those are key um, gains and opportunities going forward. I mentioned some of our partnerships that we've worked on um, that we hope hopefully going forward, we can continue. Um, so it's, it's really been a busy time, but a very, very productive um, exercise for us. Uh, and we'd like to, like you mentioned, there's Victor and there's Davis on the line, just to extend our thanks and their commitment really um, to, to, to making this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lola. Um, quickly, <laughs> uh, let me run to the next presentation and just to remind you that you already ran over, so please be a bit short. Um, thank you. just to alert the panelists that she's on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll, I'll start over. There was some issue with my... Um, my phone. Yeah, um, I'm just going to take five minutes to walk you through our work at the Serga Foundation. Uh, we created a COVID-19 Community Vulnerability Index, which we were able to integrate with the Nigeria um, COVID-19 Data Hub, really building on uh, the fantastic work that Grid3 and the NBS have, have done and already spoken to you about. So Serga Foundation integrates behavioral science and AI to bring precision to solutions. Um, and when we talk of precision, we talk about designing the right intervention for the right person at the right time. Um, of late, our work has been focused on supporting the COVID-19 response. And the cornerstone of our portfolio really has been this community vulnerability index. We first developed it for the United States, um, and it's now featured as a CDC resource. But in recent months, we've created a companion version for Africa as well. And what the CCVI is, um, is a tool to inform the COVID-19 response at a subnational level. It measures vulnerability, which we define as um, the social, economic, and health impact. So we're not talking about where the disease will spread, but instead looking at the impact when it does. Um, so this index tells us which areas are vulnerable and why, and it can be used to design targeted interventions and prioritize resources um, to those who need them the most. This is essentially what goes into the index. We look at seven themes, uh, ranging from socioeconomic status to health system factors and old age. And we drew on a host of publicly available data sets to uh, really create this multi-dimensional vulnerability metric. It's hosted on an online tool. Um, so you can go to precisionforcovid.org slash Africa, and it allows readers to explore vulnerability scores within a country or across countries and also uh, look at a breakdown uh, by these individual themes. Um, you know, the tool is only as good as it's um, used and we've been working very uh, closely with uh, GPSDD and through them, we were very fortunate to be introduced to the NBS in Nigeria. Um, given that there's a COVID data hub where a lot of relevant data sets are housed, we worked with them to embed um, 
our information onto this website. So since we have data from you know, all countries in Africa, we had to really create a country profile. So we now have country URLs that can be embedded onto uh, data hubs. And this is the example of what a country fact sheet looks like for Nigeria, which we, be, which we, were, uh, we were able to embed onto the data hub. Um, in terms of the impact, it uh, allows users to sort and compare metrics at a regional level. So you can look at different regions in Nigeria and see how they fare on the various vulnerability metrics. We were also able to add uh, data on mobility pre and post pandemic. And we were also able to estimate hospitalization and infection fatality rates, which people could, um, could look at by assuming um, different percentages of population infected. Um, so I'll just wrap up there just to say, you know, uh, thanks to the NBS and VPSDD for, you know, forming the connections. We're also working with uh, ministries of health in Africa to create detailed versions of these index. So it's currently available at the first administrative level and we're eager to deep dive to the district level. We're also creating dashboards to layer data sets on, you know, confirmed cases, deaths and testing and really working with organizations across the continent to help them um, take a targeted approach uh, towards you know, planning the interventions and allocating resources. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rahul. And there's a question in the chat. Uh, somebody wants to connect. And my sense is that if you can also provide a way within which innovators or entrepreneurs in this space can connect with your platform, then that becomes interesting, I think, for this conversation. Absolutely. Uh, on to the next Thank presentation. You. Thank you so much, Rahul. Hey, good afternoon. I'm presenting from um, Ghana and we're um, wanting to share something very quickly about um, a pilot project we're doing around citizen generated data. And so this is an area where we've been able to bring in uh, tech entrepreneurs and um, local leaders and ministry officials to work together to develop two solutions to fill data gaps within the SDGs. Um, so this came from the rationale that um, we are only reporting around a third of the SDG indicators at the moment, so we're looking at new ways and new data sources. Um, but this uh, looked at the fact that technology provides a, a great opportunity to springboard into filling these data gaps. Um, and a project that um, we're funding by GIZ, the German development partner, looked at how citizen generated data might be the key way to strengthen uh, the local data system by strengthening um, citizens as data generators and using technology as a way to fill that gap. Um, so here's a short description of the uh, approach of the project. So it's looking at gathering um, information on, on gender and waste. Um, and the project is all um, based in collaboration. So we are, uh, as the National Statistics Office, the, the data producers um, and working very closely with the data users as co-owners of the project. We also wanted to anchor this in a human rights approach to the data where the citizens are involved in both the planning and the production. And we thought that the best way to go about this was a design thinking process. Um, and that's what I'll just quickly take us through. So because we needed citizens to take up these solutions um, in order for us to get enough volume of data to make these proxy indicators, uh, we really wanted uh, to think about what would increase user adoption. Um, and we came across the process of design thinking where actually we're really centering all of the design decisions around the realities um, that citizens uh, are living in and uh, the context in which these technologies will either work or, or not work. Um, and so we took this kind of ecosystem approach which echoes um, some of what has been said earlier and looked at the different roles in the data chain of everyone who was involved. So we have everyone from our, our local authorities and local planners uh, to government ministries, to academia, um, to the developers themselves. Um, and we took our developers through a three-stage design thinking process. So this was quite different to their normal approach where we may have prescribed what the functionality of the solutions were gonna be for data collection and then just taken those solutions out into community. Instead, we brought together um, 70 uh, different 
stakeholders between the developers, the, um, the national technical team and district technical teams, so our two levels of governance, and also core users, the audiences that we expect to use this technology at the end of the day. We brought them together in a three-day um, process called the Design Thinking Event, Understanding the Problem. And the idea here was to create a shared understanding um, of what was, uh, what was needed to make this a uh, adoptable product. Um, and this was uh, the first time that um, our developers had been involved in this. We did a shortlisting process. Um, and so only eight development firms came through to this stage. So it's quite different from the hackathon um, in the sense that we are really concentrating on creating a deep understanding with a few, uh, few development organizations. Um, and so we took those developers then through a process. They were to present to us their idea, so their concept um, that would meet our need for um, citizen generated data. And then after that, submit a prototype. So we went from eight um, development firms down to one, and they produced these two solutions that we are using currently for citizen generated data. So I'm very quickly just gonna take you through the lessons learned. Um, so we found that uh, when developers were able to test their um, assumptions uh, with those that are surrounded by um, and steeped in the knowledge of the local context, they were able to uh, create something that was much more useful. Um, a big outcome of this was around making sure that neither of the solutions were dependent on literacy and so there were um, it was built in that there was a, a voice alternative to uh, all of the data collection um, uh, solutions and there was also the idea that um, some of our pilot communities do not have the digital infrastructure where they would have regular internet so we also have made sure that there were feature phone alternatives for every data collection and um, solution that was built and um, we also found that it created this um this collaborative environment where we could bring together in people in person and um, at the start of the process then created this commitment to uh, collaboration through the remainder of the project um, and so just, just some last lessons, um, because COVID struck in the middle of this process, we had that first um, in-person encounter and then we had to move the process online. So that meant um, using, uh, using Zoom and using digital uh, um, tools in order to ensure that our local actors and um, spread in pilot districts across the country were still able to participate. Um, and again, there were difficulties with the di digital infrastructure for making sure that we're not then leaving people out of the process because they weren't digitally included. Um, and so we designed a process to make sure that uh, their uh, opinions could be brought in throughout. Um, and as an output, we now have these two solutions that are being piloted in communities. So I'm sure that um, we'll be sharing results from this in, in early 2021 and GPSDD has been uh, involved in this process all along. Um, and so uh, we look to mainstream this approach of design thinking into some of our other processes at GSS. So we see this idea of whenever we are taking technologies in future, instead looking at it from um, the community reality upwards and how we can adapt the technologies to make sure that they are going to be, um, there's going to be a high user adoption at the end of the day. Um, so that was just a very quick overhaul of um, what we're doing in the collaborative space and that kind of fostering um, of collaborations with uh, technology sector in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel, and sorry for rushing you on the presentation. I think for me, the, the last four presentations are also kind of to begin to disrupt the mindset of, of startups and people in the innovation space. The last four presentations were led by government. So I think this is something that has to go through very clear. And you can see how when African public sector adopts technology, they can actually lead, but also I think can collaborate quite effectively uh, and respond yes, but also to think through how these systems and innovations can be resilient and live beyond a crisis. Um, the last presentation, I hope uh, the vice chair of the committee is here. I know he had a hard stop, uh, Peter and Jonjo, uh, if he can give his comments. Uh, if not, we can close. Okay, I guess he had to drop. Uh, so I think, finally, I think for me, um, in my closing remarks, it's, it's, it's basically just to think through 
that we are in a situation where the pandemic basically has put us in a situation where it is it is, it is no longer thought through as a linear pandemic that it's not about responding the recovery then we build resilience over time i think it's flipping the model and the model is how do we build resiliency so that we can respond faster and recover faster and throughout the, the showcase but also through from the keynote uh, of the chair uh, it's all about building resiliency it's how do we do the fundamentals whether it's around capacity and competencies whether it's around uh, an agile governance framework that actually enables innovators to collaborate with government whether it's about innovative financing uh yes peter <laughs> let me just go through back to you before i wrap up i was trying to buy it back to you vc okay uh thank you thank you so much uh philip so my uh my, mine is not a presentation i don't have any slides i will just uh, uh talk through and uh and one of the things that uh i was to share was around uh, the lessons uh from uh twiga uh twiga foods you know as uh, we raise funding as we are trying to scale the business and uh what it is that we can actually share with uh with, uh, with everybody else. I think one of the key things, you know, especially for companies that are raising uh, funding in the early stages is around what I call management capability. A lot of times, you know, we present a strategy, but we don't spend time thinking about, you know, do I have the capability that will be required to then deliver against this strategy? So one of the things that we learned very early on is uh, building a strong team uh, that uh, demonstrates the ability to execute against a strategy is, uh, is critical. The second thing that we learned is as an entrepreneur, you need to have skin in the game. When, uh, when you start a business, what the investors want to see is how vested are you in the enterprise. And, uh, and because of that, what I learned is that, you know, making those early investments uh, in the business helped at least uh, when it came to uh, raising of capital. The third most important thing is around governance. And how do you then ensure that you know, the organization is well structured so that somebody who's then going to invest money in that organization feels comfortable that their investment is, is safe. So again, we spent quite a bit on governance in the, in the early stages. In terms of uh, the, the challenges uh, that, uh, that I faced you know, uh, with my co-founder as we set up the business in the early stages, I think the first one was you know, when uh, you don't have access to uh, capital, attracting uh, the, um, the management talent uh, was again uh, a bit of a challenge. So how we overcome this challenge was by issuing equity to some of our earlier management uh, recruit, uh, recruitees. And because of that, we're able to attract the right type of talent that uh, made us uh, uh, very, very uh, compelling when uh, we shared this uh, with the investors, you know, just looking at the strategy that we were pursuing and the management team. The, the second bit is, uh, you know, I talked about putting skin in the game. Uh, one of the big challenges uh, that we faced as Trigger is that uh, early stage capital was of course uh, a huge challenge and, uh, and, and funding the business uh, was hard in the early days. So um, what I, my wife and I ended up doing is that uh, we sold our matrimonial home and uh, invested the proceeds in the business. And that's how we actually got the company to a point where it was investable. Uh, because, uh, you know, with, uh, with everybody else who was in the company then, uh, there were none investing uh, partners. So again, uh, the challenge was on me in terms of uh, trying to find a, a source of capital. So again, that will be the second challenge, which I think is a challenge that's very, very common, even with, uh, with the businesses that we've looked at. Then the third piece is also the, the structuring process and uh, ensuring that you know, you're able to protect the integrity of the business, even operating in a tough environment. You know, I remember the due diligence process that we underwent with Goldman Sachs. We had to, of course, uh, uh, be audited in line with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the UK Anti-Bribery Act. And, uh, and in all, all those two due diligence processes, you know, we managed to, uh, we managed to, uh, to, uh, to pass the, uh, the exercise. And uh, this is with uh, having um, hundreds of vehicles on the road every day, uh, exposed to uh, all sorts of situations on our roads, especially with uh, uh, 
the rent seeking behavior that we see with some of uh, the law enforcement officers at the lower levels. And again, ensuring that, you know, how do you ensure that uh, you create a culture within the organization that even if your distribution van is stopped, then send a lawyer to start negotiating and put a bond for it. You do that a few times and, uh, and people kind of uh, stop, uh, stop bothering you because uh, they know that nothing will come out. So, so the key thing is that what are some of uh, the things that I've seen as a uh, vice chair of uh, the COVID ICT committee and what are some of uh, the observations? I think one of the key things that I have seen is that, you know, there's a lot of brilliant minds that we have, not just in Kenya, but uh, across the continent. And, uh, and I think uh, this talks to the opportunity that lies in, uh, on the continent. When you look at the uh, bulk of where money is spent, the basic problems to be solved in food, healthcare, education and transport. So, and again, we've seen a lot of uh, new innovative ideas in this space. Um, one thing I felt that uh, was a recurring need, especially as the innovations were shared, was uh, the need of uh, mentorship, especially around how do you think of a business in a way that creates value even out, outside of a technical innovation. So a lot of people would focus on the technical innovation, but don't step back to then think about how do I then create value from this? So because when you're asking for somebody to invest in your business, then you have to demonstrate how you're going to give a return against uh, that investment. So again, there's a bit of mentorship there. And I think that there's an opportunity for more established entrepreneurs or more established professional managers to dedicate time uh, in uh, giving back to young entrepreneurs who are in the early stages of their ventures. The third piece is around uh, the need for seed capital because uh, one of the things that was very, very clear is that there is a lot of funding that's available for more mature organizations. If you're raising a million dollars plus, it looks like you know there's a vibrant uh, ecosystem uh, for you as a business. The problem is that if you're looking at raising between uh, zero and five hundred thousand uh, dollars, that's a very, very tough space because no one's really playing in that space. And I think this is somewhere where we really need to put our heads together in terms of how to create a vibrant ecosystem that provides this type of startup capital, because without that, you cannot have proof of concept. And then the, the last piece is also a huge opportunity for incubators uh, to help businesses build a requisite governance and, uh, and the requisite structures to, uh, to actually attract investment. So, so those are my main observations serving on the committee. And the last piece was around uh, the policy perspective. You know, what are some of the key things that uh, we feel that from a policy standpoint, uh, we could look at uh, uh, implementing? I think one of the things is that, you know, we need to create platforms that provide uh, better transparency on harnessing innovation and protecting intellectual property. You know, by having this uh, COVID ICT uh, committee and openly seeking ideas around innovation with the public, we attracted over 700 entries of different people giving us different ideas around innovation. And that's because also we created a safe environment for those entrepreneurs to feel that their intellectual property was safe if they were to then uh, share their ideas with us. And, uh, and I think, you know, on an ongoing basis, I think there's a need for that. Uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, the, the openness of young people coming up with uh, new innovations and sharing them does not end with uh, the life of this committee. Uh, the second piece I think also is that the government needs to create greater awareness on what the government agencies are doing around innovation. I mean, we had presentations from uh, institutions like Kenya who are doing an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, piece of work around creating an enabling environment for innovation in the country. But I think um, this work is happening in pockets and it's really not visible to the external world. And I think there's an opportunity for us to have more visibility for what government is doing in that space, but also ensuring that these institutions are funded for the potential impact. If you wanna create a, a billion dollar uh, businesses out of uh, technology, then again, I think you may need to have an investment that is commensurate to the, to the opportunity that uh, you are chasing as a, as, a, as a government. And I think there's an opportunity just to uh, scale a bit of uh, the investments that is sitting in uh, some of these uh, agencies. But again, you see the capability, you see the energy, you see the enthusiasm and passion, and there's, I think, a lot of energy 
in that space. And then uh, the last piece around policy, I think is to create better linkages between government innovation initiatives and uh, private sector funded hubs. Because on one hand, you have private sector uh, funds saying we do not have enough deal pipeline. And on the other hand, you have uh, the innovation hub saying maybe we're not getting enough high quality innovations. And I think the key thing is that, you know, if there's better collaboration between these two pieces, I think we could actually start creating an ecosystem that uh, creates a little bit more momentum uh, as far as uh, harnessing innovation in the country is concerned. So, uh, so Philip, I think those are just some of the, the insights I wanted to share on my journey in Twigger and uh, my journey on the committee and also some of the policy perspectives. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. I don't think there's really anything to, more to add <laughs> after, after your insights. It's a true masterclass. And if we could cut that piece of a video and potentially share that, uh, it would be quite interesting. I think there's, I mean, it's, it comes down to the basics. It's the soft skills, right? It's, it's, it's the business acumen. It's being able to have a, an agile governance framework. It's to collaborate. Um, it's, 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 it's the issue of self-sacrifice. They kind of just raw sheer hard work that it's not about expecting somebody to invest if you've not invested uh, in, in the business opportunity. And I think for me, that's really speaks of the African narrative. And it could be, I mean, whatever you've just presented could be a story of Ghana who are in the who are in, in this call. It could be a, a story of Nigeria. It could be a story of uh, South Africa. Uh, we just did not have time, but we also had Sierra Leone. We had Senegal. And it could, be, it could simply be an African story where how do we potentially then understand that we have these building blocks. Um, we have the opportunity, we have the talent. Uh, Africa's median age is 19.7, we're the youngest population ever. Uh, as Elsie mentioned in her presentation, young people see this as an opportunity. So how do we not waste a good crisis? Um, Susan mentioned the opportunity for young women. The chair mentioned what you have done amazingly over the last five, six months in terms of identifying the pillars and the levers that need to be disrupted so that we can unlock uh, innovative potential, whether it's from the idea stage to the VC stage and to social impact, which is what Susan, I think was talking about um, the SDG opportunity that SDG presents business opportunity. Some of us see it as a development opportunity, but that, again, money could be made. And I think to what uh, the PS uh, Jerome made when he was speaking from, from the CS speech to a lead in terms of that collaboration between the UNDP and, um, and, and, and the government of Kenya to create this resilient lab or accelerator that then wants to begin to test these three innovations that came out of Konza and potentially use that as a learning. The other piece I think would be how do we also connect with you <laughs> who, who was on the other side, if, even as these three nascent innovations are powered through, the lessons that you've learned could be quite useful for these three innovations that I think are coming up. And potentially also I see the opportunity at continental level where we have uh, big private sector companies. And that is something that I've seen rolling through all the presentations that you had an established entity, whether it was Esri, Google, Facebook, Frame, there was somebody who was established who was ready and open and willing to work with an upcoming startup, but also collaborate with government. And so for me, that then begins to show how collaboration works in terms of how you build upon something that is already established so that you don't make the same mistakes, but also you, you don't necessarily have the same levers or financial capability that they have. So I think for me, that has been interesting and, and as a lesson for this uh, uh, webinar that was potentially a showcase of what is possible uh, if we collaborate beyond COVID-19 and how we build resiliency to manage another crisis. I think when you go to Tule's presentation, she talked about we were in the middle of a locust <laughs> and, and COVID happened. So, so then how do we build resiliency so that we are not always responding? but simply turn this mechanism to respond, but then beyond resiliency, then we use that as a, an opportunity for transformation and growth. And I think for me, that, that would what uh, I'd want to end. And just to thank, uh, of course, the ICT committee for co-hosting this with us, uh, the Secretariat, Rehab, and Dr. Njau, um, Grid3 uh, Global Partnership for, for, for being able to help us mobilize Ghana and Nigeria for South African government and Sansa for LC, for Dr. LC Kanza and the World Economic Forum, for UNDP, Walid, uh, for Susan and Stanbeck, 
uh, for the chair, of course, uh, and, the, and the CS for, for providing this enabling environment. Thank you so much and hope that we can connect soon beyond this platform. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Philip. Thanks, thanks Philip. Thank thanks. You, thanks, Thunderbird. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Philip. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.